Andy Smith is an appreciative inquiry facilitator, emotional intelligence coach, and an NLP trainer who is from England, lives in France, and conducts trainings all over the world. Today, he will tell us all about appreciative inquiry and how that can be used coaching teams to facilitate better cooperation and communication and also in coaching individuals. I love Andy's fresh way of thinking about coaching skills, and I know that you will too. Here we go. You are listening to the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast, a show devoted to uncovering the systems and the secrets that set the best apart, where you learn how to take your coaching clients to the next level, while you grow the coaching practice of your dreams. So sit back and relax, or sit up and get excited. Either way, you might want to pay attention. This could be important. Welcome, Andy Smith. So great to see you again, my friend. How are you? I'm good. Uh, Yeah, I'm sitting here in my house in France in the middle of a thunderstorm at the moment. (laughs) I didn't know you were in France. Yeah, um, yeah, moved. Uh, we moved over 2011. Oh. So, yeah, this uh, could never have a house this big with this much land in the UK. Uh, so. Wow. And I was just imagining it was one of those beautiful thatched roofs, cottages <laughs> in Europe or something. Where are you? Uh, that's pretty much uh, like hedge fund managers that have those, I think. I think. <laughs> <laughs> so so okay so we won't talk about your level of success then <laughs> <laughs> so what part of france are you in we're in the the limousin which is right in the middle it's uh very green hills forests lakes low population density low crime uh low broadband speed unfortunately <laughs> um but yeah it's great it's um it's real quality of life out here Nice. Sounds great. Um, also a good place to be riding out COVID-19, I suspect. Best possible place. I think we've got a nice big garden. We're on the edge of a forest. Uh, very few neighbors. So, yeah, it's great. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, I'm glad you're, you're safe and doing well. So we are talking about essential coaching skills. Uh, this is the Essential Coaching Skills podcast. So I've known you for a long time as a master of NLP. You've been teaching NLP certification courses and master practitioner certification courses for a long time. You've written some books on NLP. NLP exercises is a book that I've used a lot in my own trainings. Just always been a really um, wonderful resource to have at hand. Thanks, Doug. Glad to hear it. Oh, no, it's been great. It's been great. And what's your, you have another book on NLP too. Is it, do you not? Um, well, I have a whole series of ebooks, the practical NLP series, which pretty much covers the whole NLP practitioner course, uh, syllabus and a bit of master practitioner. Only one of those so far has actually made it into print because it, um, it's, it's the only one I've converted so far to do that kind of self printing on demand thing. Hmm. Um, I, I wrote a book, uh, I, I was approached to write a book in about 2006 uh, by Darling Kindersley called Achieve Your Goals, which was everything I knew about goal setting at that time. And they beautifully designed it and um, it looked great, apart from the cover, which was very plain. But inside, you open it up, it's beautiful color illustrations, amazing photos, diagrams. And um, it was good while it lasted, but then it didn't kind of... I didn't promote it perhaps enough and uh, you probably won't see a copy these days, but uh, yeah. So published author by a proper publisher. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and what was the title of that book? That was called achieve your goals. It was part of, uh, I'm going to have, I would have to look up the title of the series. There are a whole series of uh, books about negotiation and uh, you know, success in business and uh, probably stress management and that kind of thing. They, they released them as a, as a series. Just oh. a little little thing like that. Sounds great, though. Yeah, I think I might have actually seen that. It's a little thing. It's know. a little thing. It's got a green and white cover. Dawling Kindersley, the publishers. You can still get it on Amazon, I think, from suppliers outside Amazon, one of those. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. Neat. Probably for like $50, $50 or yeah, something exactly. ridiculous that no one's ever going to pay for it. 
<laughs> That's how it stays in stock. You know, just we have a million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> it's a million dollars. A million yeah. Million. yeah. But if they do buy it, then you're all set. Um, <laughs> so you also have been doing a lot of training in faraway places, correct? Yeah. Um, oh, you hear that thunder? I did. Maybe yeah. not. Yeah. Okay. So that's happening. Um, yeah. Um, again, I was approached by an agency in Malaysia about 15, 15, 16 years ago. Uh, so I've been running courses for them in Malaysia, Qatar, Dubai, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, which was interesting. Uh, and then another agency, which I'm just doing stuff in Malaysia and occasionally uh, Dubai for at the moment. But of course, that's all quietened down now with the, uh, with the epidemic, with the pandemic. Right, indeed. And you are also more into a thing you were talking about, appreciative um, interviewing? Appreciative inquiry, yeah. Oh, yeah. Or uh, appreciative... That? Appreciative inquiry, uh, I believe a lot of Americans call it. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so shall I say a little bit about that? I um, think you should, yes, because I don't know that many people know, but I know very, very little about it, only what you've told me so far. Okay. Um, probably for a podcast about coaching, it's probably best to describe it as uh, a group coaching format. Uh, a really good format for coaching a a team or a group of people, ideally in an organization because then they 've got shared um, shared language shared goals but uh, it could be you know just a bunch of people in a community and uh, it solves problems or generates solutions to problems or just generates improvements rather than by analyzing the problem and trying to find what caused it and trying to apportion blame and fix gaps and so on. It, um, it looks at what's working. And when you identify what's working, when you look at the conditions which give rise to success and you put more of those in place and you do more of what's working, then things can improve. So uh, it, it ties in with positive psychology, um, solution focus, I guess, although that's perhaps more of an individual thing. Um, it's kind of in parallel to those. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because I, I, I've i known that sort of approach for a long time. It is it, it ties very well in with NLP, but I've also just known of that kind of approach for a long time. And I wish to God I had a coach when I was playing athletics back in high school who had even this a little bit of that <laughs> motion because the coaches that I had were like, how, how could you do such a stupid thing? O'Brien, you know, you know, it's never, <laughs> never going like that was really positive. How can we build on positive? You know, it never was that for me as, as an athlete, as a young know, student athlete. But, uh, but I think it's uh, from what I've seen, r- many now um, teams are building in that sort of way that they they are building on the success and finding, you know, this solution oriented sort of thing. Um, when you talk about teams, however, you're talking about business for the most part that you're working with. Is that correct? Um, yeah. Business, um, local government, uh, charities, quite a lot, nonprofits. Um, and uh, I'll tell you where it's really big in the U.S. is uh, churches, church communities use appreciative inquiry. A lot of them use appreciative inquiry a lot. Uh-huh. Uh, I guess I guess probably not the fundamentalist ones, but uh, maybe the yeah, maybe the other ones. So tell me, uh, can you give me an example of how that would work? You know, how what is it appreciative? How how do, how would a team use appreciative in- inquiry? Okay. Um, so let's take an example that's applicable to almost any team. Okay. Um, because you can use it not just for fixing problems, but for if something is good, then let's just improve our performance a bit more. Uh, let's say you want your team to work together more effectively and just communicate better. Let me so, just stop you real quick. Is this something that could yeah. conceivably be done as a, at a regular basis? Like you could do it every every month or a continual way of talking? Um 
You could, you could, well, you could build your, you could build a little bit of appreciation into your regular team meetings, for example. Uh So just something as small as uh, just starting the team meeting by asking for uh, what examples of success have you had in the last, uh, last week or the last month, however much it is between meetings. Don't, don't go around the meeting going, you, what have you achieved? You, what have you achieved? But um, just invite people to contribute any successes that they've been part of. And that will put the whole meeting into a better frame of mind uh, for general ideas, coming up, with, um, coming up with solutions to any problems they do face, making quicker decisions and so on. So you've got a, a formal kind of format for appreciative inquiry called the 5D uh, format because, or 4D, sometimes they, they miss out the defining the affirmative topic at the beginning um, or 5D. If you include that, they are five stages. They all begin with D. So you define your topic in a positive way. So how do we communicate better as a team? Something like that. And what you're doing there is you're setting the frame for what we're going to inquire into uh, which keeps things on track, keeps things relevant, uh, kind of stops people from going off into negative and complaining if they remember that that's what they're supposed to be inquiring into. Uh, next stage discovery is about finding out what's working and finding out the best examples of performance. So it's a little bit like if if um, if your listeners are familiar, some of that, some of them are, I know, with NLP. Uh, it's a little bit like that. We're not interested in the average. We're interested in the peaks. We're interested in the exceptions, the positive exceptions when things are really good and we can look at what actually causes those. So the way we find those usually is to get team members to sit down with each other in pairs and interview each other and get each other, uh, find out from the other person, uh, get them to tell you a story of a time when you had a really good experience related to uh, effective teamwork, for example. When's the best piece of effective teamwork you've ever been part of? And rather than uh, going for like bullet points or analysis or opinion from a distance, we're looking for stories. We're looking for the person to relive their experience as they tell you about it and lose themselves in it. So they start to associate back into that time, feel the same feelings that they felt then, because that's giving them a lot more high quality information. Um, what, uh, what letter D what does that start with? Uh, that is discovery. Discovery. Okay. Discovery. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and then you'd follow that up with, okay, what's important to you about this experience, uh, which as you know, will help them to clarify their values a little bit around, mm-hmm. around that. So you get some idea of what motivates people, what's important to people. Uh, you could ask what, uh, conditions were in place that enabled that success that made it possible if we can start identifying those factors, we, if we put them in place a bit more widely in the working environment, uh, it could be, you know, it could be leadership, could be teamwork, could be the physical space they were working in, uh, could be access to budgets or information. If we can put those in place a bit more widely, then that success is going to happen more often. All right. All so right. Um, you might be working with a group. At, sorry, go on. What D is that? That is, that's discovery. That's all part of the discovery. So we're looking for, we're looking for examples of success, what contributes to it, what's important about it. We're looking for stories essentially, because, um, as, uh, Yuval Noah Harari says, you know, stories are pretty much what distinguish us from the animals and enable us to cooperate together and, and so on. So stories are super important. Mm. Okay. So generally the atmosphere in the room, has changed at this point. Right. People are buzzing. They are positive because they, you know, people, once they realize they're not going to get cut down for it, then they love talking about their successes, achievements, things that are meaningful to them, things they're proud of. So the atmosphere in the room will have changed. And this is particularly true if you can get people in different roles that don't normally work together or at different levels to interview each other 
they open up to each other. They start understanding each other's viewpoints better. Yes. And I, ideally, you're going to involve everyone who's going to be affected by any kind of change that you're planning in determining what that change is so that they feel the change is theirs. So it, it also, just in itself, in the process, enables the team to communicate better with each other. Yeah, I'm sure it does. Sure it does. Yeah. Ir- irrespective, even if you're asking them about it, you know, to look into a different subject altogether. Right. So does this discovery just, process go on for hours and hours and hours, or is this a five-minute <laughs> exercise? Or? Um, if you're going to do the whole thing in one go, the absolute bare minimum that you'd need, I think, is half a day, say three and a half hours. That's for the discovery. Pretty much the yeah. If you're working with a if you're working with a group because they have to share yeah. their experiences. If you're going through it one to one with somebody, you could do that in like a ninety minute coaching session. Probably you could get through the whole cycle. Interesting. Cool. Yeah. What's the third step after discovery? Okay, so the next step is dream, mm-hmm. and uh, what we're doing here is we are the group as a whole is creating some sort of vision of what their ideal future will be like. So it's not goal setting as such. We're not dealing in precise quantities or times. We're not quantifying anything. In fact, we're doing it kind of metaphorically because the more vague and metaphorical it is, the less there is to disagree about between people. We're going up high into the metaphorical realm, big chunk, and then later on, we come down into the details and what we're actually going to do. So what you get people to do uh, in groups of six or eight is to collaborate on creating some kind of artistic representation of what this ideal future will be. So they might have a piece of flip chart paper, a load of colored pens, a load of um, post-it notes in different shapes, uh, little pipe cleaners and balloons they can do 3D stuff with. Um, so whatever can they, they want to create. Do interpretive dance or write a song? <sighs> interpretive dance. Uh, we did have somebody uh, come up with a song at one point in one group. Um, we had someone else uh, come up with a, you know, like a, a DJ uh, came up with a <laughs> rap. We, right. we have had interpretive dance. We've had living sculpture. We've had mime. Right. Um, I did a, a training course in Estonia a couple of years ago, and it seems they love theater over there because every single group in there came up with um, a little theatrical sketch of uh, two or three okay. minutes long. So, great. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Love it. So yeah. any art form you like uh, is, is great there. Yeah. So they, they create this thing. Um, they present it to other groups in the room. If you're working with a, oh yeah, this is the other thing I should say. It's very scalable. So you could work with a team of six, eight people. If you had a team of 12, you probably have two groups, two tables. You could have a whole organization in there. You could have a hundred people in the room or 200 people in the room. Um, just by having more tables. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, you probably need a few people to flip between tables and keep them on track, but uh, it's essentially it's a very scalable process. Nice. So I've worked with like 150 people sometimes. Um, so they've created this thing. They present it to the room. This has given them some ideas about where they want to get to. Uh, we're not bothered about how possible it is or how they practically get there because even if you only get 20% of the way there, that is 20% further on than you are now. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, next stage is the design stage. Uh, the way I tend to treat this with uh, teams and small groups is it's a little bit like the uh, what is it the option stage in the grow model where people come up with ideas about what they could do. Um, they're not committing to anything at this point. It's like, what could you do? What else could we do? What else could we do? Um, so you could slot in your favorite idea generation uh, strategy there. You could s- slot in the Disney strategy for creativity, for example. I've done that sometimes. Or uh, six thinking hats or whatever. So the idea is to come up with loads and loads and loads of ideas. Um, If you're working on a bigger scale, like whole organization, it might be more about how do we need to reconfigure the organization in order to support this dream that we've, uh, that we've created. Mm 
But team level, it's usually what should we do? What else can we do? What else can we do? Final stage. So now you've got a load of ideas. Final stage is uh, the, well, classically, it's called the destiny stage. Um, a lot of people call it the delivery stage, which I tend to favor because it's kind of more business friendly. Mm -hmm. Um, it sounds more down to earth. It sounds less like off in the clouds to a a business audience. Yeah. So, uh, but it's, it's the same thing. It's, it's looking at all of these ideas, which parts of it are we going to take forward right now? Um, so you could, uh, you could end up with a plan, essentially. It could be like conventional action planning. It could be more like let a thousand flowers bloom and let's try loads of different things and we'll drop the ones that don't work and we'll keep the ones that do work. And you could use the same process six months, a year down the line to review how things have gone and uh, you know, amend your, amend your dream and come up with some more ideas and fix any fix any problems that have occurred and build on the success you've had. So this is what I've been largely doing for the last, uh, I don't know, five, five years is what I've been focusing on, I think, um, because I love it yeah. and it's easy. And it does seem to, just from a, my, my perspective, my viewpoint, it seems like it would tie in very easily with NLP that you could use a lot of the skills that you have to, overcome objections or to reframe things that come up, you know, ask good questions through the meta model to find out what they're really thinking or. Yeah. But the thing is you don't generally need to, because uh-huh. it's a different process. Um, the, well, classic NLP um, compared to say, I don't know, something that's more influenced maybe by a generative or Ericksonian type approach It is a little bit like, I know they say it isn't, but it is a little bit like having a skilled mechanic looking at a car engine and seeing where things have gone wrong, right? Mm. Uh, So appreciative inquiry isn't like that. Uh, The ideas come from within the group. So I'm just facilitating, really. I guess I have to have rapport with the... uh, with the group, I mm-hmm. have to frame things in a way that they'll understand it uh, and get behind it. But um, yeah, it doesn't doesn't require kind of superhuman visual acuity or remembering kind of techniques or language patterns or anything like that. You just got to be be there, be sincere, pay attention to them, and ask the ask them to do these things, and it it works. Yeah. So. Just for the fun of it, because this is called the Essential mm-hmm. Coaching Skills Podcast, if there were sure. an essential skill that um, would be essential for doing that su- process successfully, um, what would mm-hmm. you say that would set you know somebody like you apart who's really good at it and has taken all over the world to do it, and um, somebody who's just you know starting out and wants to know what they need to know to do that? Uh, okay. I think the main, a kind of, a kind of fundamental that you probably need and it won't work without it is probably rapport. Actually, Mm -hmm. I think, um, rapport, rapport is pretty much essential, which is, uh, you know, it's nice because it's an overlap with NLP as well. Um, there's, um, There's a book which I forget the name of that's come out recently by uh, Richard Boyatzis and some other people. Um, I'm looking for it now, but I may have got it. Yeah, I may may have it on my Kindle actually, rather than the physical book, um, where he's talking. I think it's called Helping People Change. Oh, we can maybe flash that up on the screen afterwards <laughs> yeah, when we looked it up. Um, yeah, he's <laughs> uh, he. He's talking about the difference between coaching with compassion and coaching for compliance. Um, So they've identified two different uh, networks in human neurology. Um, They 
there, there are sort of um, scientific names for them, but they have renamed them the empathic network and the analytic network. Hmm. Uh, yeah, task positive network is the uh, is the kind of technical name for the analytical one, and uh, default mode network is the analytical name for the empathic one. They have different characteristics, and um, if one is lit up, the other one is kind of suppressed, and vice versa. So the analytic mode is if we are under threat, if we are dealing with problems, if we are trying to solve a problem, if we are trying to hit a deadline, uh, we've got like blinkers on, we're very task focused, we're trying to achieve something. The empathic mode is more about relationship than task. It's about being open to new ideas. It's kind of slightly more dreamy, more receptive, more creative. You need both, but you need them at different stages in the goal achievement or problem-solving process. Mm -hmm. Um, Most people uh, being managed at work probably it's more the analytic mode that's being encouraged and stimulated, which is fine for uh, achieving a step-by-step plan, but um, it's not so great for creative thinking or taking on new ideas. So when you are in rapport with somebody, you're tending to light up that empathic network within them, which helps them to relax, be more creative, be more open to new ideas, see different possibilities, lift their eyes from this particular little goal that's on the horizon for them. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're telling them what to do, or if, uh, if like these athletics coaches that you, you were yeah. talking about, they are criticizing your performance all the time, that puts you into analytic mode and it makes it much harder to actually learn to do something new. So, uh, yeah, so you want your group, certainly in the early stages of appreciative inquiry to be more in that empathic mode so that they can come up with new ideas, come up with generative solutions to problems. You know, that Einstein thing that he allegedly said that you can't, solve a problem with the same level of thinking that created it in the first place, whether or not he said that, I don't know. Um, Yeah. So that's the mode you want people to be in right up until they're actually planning, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you want to get them to be thinking differently. Yeah. Just, you know, maybe, maybe using thinking skills that they use all the time outside of work or when they're enjoying themselves or when they're, yeah, in, you know, if they've got a hobby of like painting or creating something or music or whatever, uh, that's probably the mode they're in, but they're not necessarily used to bringing it into work. So if a, if a person really needs to have that ability to have rapport, if that's an essential coaching skill, how does one go about getting or refining or enhancing their coach, their, their rapport skills? Um, well, you've got the standard kind of, uh, drills and exercises that you get on an NLP practitioner course or maybe Mat- NLP foundation. Skills. Yeah, but those don't work if they're done artificially, as we know. Right. Right. <laughs> I don't think anyway. So I People would say can the chances are very good that you are extremely competent at this. So how how do you do it when you walk into a place in Malaysia or, you know, yeah? How do you how do you how do you get um, a bunch of new people that maybe don't even speak your same language? Well, ever yeah, everyone speaks business English out there because um, okay. it, it right. is at least um, yeah, certainly in in the cities at least uh, people are trained uh, taught. Uh, Malay and they're also taught English in the Malaysian education system and then they've probably got if they're not ethnic Malays then they probably also have um, there's an Indian community there and there's a Chinese community there so they will have uh, either Chinese or um, language from wherever their family was in India on top of that as well 
Uh, so the, usually their English is pretty good at the kind of exec- executive level that I'm uh, teaching them at. Um, let me let me just think. Um, it's certainly easier when you are relaxed and confident yourself. That's for sure because your fears get in the way. If you're in analytic mode yourself, right. Right. Uh, right. that's going to inhibit you from picking up on. Um, signals and so on. So the more, you, have any you know, the more times I go for yourself to be, you know? <laughs> yeah, um, I do. I still do that thing of, uh, centering myself, um, which comes from, <laughs> yeah, it ca- comes thing. from martial arts, uh, specifically Aikido where you pay attention to your central points and, uh, Anytime you feel yourself getting a little bit off balance, you just kind of refocus yourself there. Um, this is yeah, like I a was, body thing, or were you your body, body, Yeah, like an like an embodiment type of type of thing. Yeah, and I, I did I did a little bit of um, studying Aikido, you know, like twenty years ago. Not enough to get any good at fighting people, but enough to to give me that anyway. Okay, and uh, that certainly works in terms of calming you down, making you feel stronger. Um, peripheral vision is uh, another thing that I use. Oh, of, uh, totally yeah, totally paying totally. attention. Yeah. So may- maybe you're, as, we, as we're doing this on uh, video, <laughs> maybe, you're, uh, maybe your viewers will like to try this. Don't do it when you're driving, though, folks. Um, <laughs> so if you just look straight ahead with soft eyes and then you gradually become more and more aware of what you can see, either side of whatever point it is you're looking at and just let that widen all the way out. Nice. Uh, uh, yeah. Until you, you can actually test this. If you lift your hands up to the side of your head and kind of wiggle your fingers, you'll find a point where you can see the fingers when they're wiggling, but not when they're still. So that's the very edge, the periphery of your vision. And considering our eyes are facing forwards, it's amazing how far around it goes. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, so I quite often do that as like a warm up on my uh, training courses anyway. And I encourage them to take their field of awareness even further around. So you don't just do it for that. yourself. You have the whole room do it. So it kind of. I can I can ask the whole room to do it. Uh, yeah, so quite often dropped in as a kind of uh, self management exercise. In if I'm teaching emotional intelligence, for example, or just like a a warm up if we're doing yeah. NLP to encourage sensory acuity. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite uh, so way to it, start a seminar is to say before we start. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's one of my favorite ways to start, and then doing some sort of exercise. Like that, where it's just, uh, yeah. you know, it's a group activity that we all can, you know, do without failing and just you know, mm. have a fun thing to do together. Yeah, yeah it's, it's always nice to put that, um, what is that frame called? This, uh, this shows you how long I've been out of NLP training. That frame where, you know, when you do an exercise, the discovery frame, yeah, where you're not competing. It like it's not about how yeah. well you can do it. It's about what you learn while you're doing it. Yeah. yeah. A little overlap. Um, There's a different part of the discovery frame. Yeah, uh, yeah I guess. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, indeed. It, it is. Um, so the idea being that people are the experts on their own experience. So, That's correct. you know, I thought I, I've got no idea about, you know, Malaysian business life, really. Um, all we can you do is say like, a peripheral vision, you know, you know that. Well, <laughs> they, they do now. Yeah. One would assume, <laughs> <laughs> One would assume people with eyeballs have, peripheral vision um so that seems like a really good thing to to do because it does i think does help you get into your state of openness and but it also helps to have everyone else doing the same thing and having fun doing it it's a good way to create rapport in a room like that yeah so that would be a really great answer for this first question which was uh how, what's an essential coaching skill for you as a coach The other part that I like to ask people, because um, many of our listeners are people who are striving to be coaches, you know, make a living out there in the, in the world as a coach. And so I'm also asking what, 
what advice or what do you think would be an essential skill for someone to have or be able to develop to be successful in business as a coach? What's an essential coaching skill from that side of the coin? Hmm. Well, um, like, uh, like some kind of giant figures in NLP that you've been telling me about, that I'm not even going to name the names of, uh, I don't consider myself particularly successful, uh, in, uh, on, on the business side. Out. Well, yeah, but, um, it's, it's a little bit of that. It's a little bit of that Tim Ferriss thing where you, um, excuse me, where you find, you find somewhere in the world where the stuff that you like and want and nice things aren't actually anywhere near as expensive as where you came from. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the bit of France that we're in, the Limousin is actually the, the cheapest, uh, place to buy houses and buy land. And for my money, it's also the nicest part of France as well, because it's not overcrowded and it's quiet and it's peaceful. The weather is better than the UK, but it's not kind of, not incredibly scorching in the summer. I guess if you're uh, hasn't been up to that. Anybody's weather. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That is true. I used to live in Manchester, so it's, uh, it, yeah, I'm <laughs> definitely pretty much anywhere. <laughs> it's an improvement. Yeah. Um, do they have gold toilets, though? Uh, they do not have gold toilets, I'm afraid. Oh. No, all lifts. Oh. Well, I, how could you possibly live there? Um, uh. I don't understand. <laughs> Okay, so um, uh, all, all of this was by way of buying myself a little bit of time to think <laughs> seriously about your question. <laughs> all right, so um, first thing, uh, I think a lot of successful people are they're successful because they happen to have been lucky. So you could have people who are equally smart, equally hardworking, uh, perhaps have kind of taken an equal number of chances and they haven't succeeded. But the ones who did succeed, uh, those are the ones we take advice from because, wow, look at how successful they are. And they don't realize very often that it was luck that played a part in what they're doing. Obviously, to an extent, we make our own look, luck. There are things we can do to sabotage ourselves which we shouldn't do any of those. Um, so how can we, how can we capitalize on that? How can we kind of make that into some sort of principle for success? I the, would say, feet, please go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would say we try different things. Um, you know, in some, in some, this is, this is a thing that, uh, Jervis Bush, the uh, the guy who originated Clear Leadership, another um, discipline related to appreciative inquiry that I'm very uh, interested in, uh, but not clear, clear Leadership. It's called. Uh, that he has a book called Clear Leadership, which uh, I and seriously recommend Jervis. everyone. Jervis Bush, yeah, um, it's it looks like Jervais. It's G E R V A S E, and then Bush with an E. Okay. Yeah, he's not, he's. Not of the uh, you know it's not the presidential bush family he's oh, yeah. uh, he's in somewhere the big, big um, yeah. it's, uh, yeah so he's uh he's written this book called clear leadership and um he also has this concept of generative leadership where there's a big sort of um idea in corporate leadership of the visionary ceo the visionary leader mm -hmm. the, the, the leader that has this vision of the promised land where they're going to lead the company to and they have the skills to get people to buy into them. So you, you get these kind of heroic CEO figures like, uh, I guess Steve Jobs would be a real, real example mm -hmm. of a, of a visionary leader. Um, but sometimes there are situations where the, nobody knows what's going on, even the leader. So their vision might be wrong or there's just too many unknown variables mm. uh, for them to know what, the, what on earth is going on. Like, like the current situation, really, I think, right. um, you know, uh, the platform we're on now, Zoom has got, very lucky in this situation because people can't go to physical meetings anymore. So they want a user-friendly platform. And I think they're, 
their usage, their customer base has gone up by like factor of 10 or something yeah, like that, like that yeah, uh, for sure around there. So, so they've done, you know, they got, they kind of got lucky in this situation. Yeah, that's true. Right um, yeah. Who could have predicted it? Well, I think there were like governmental uh, health panels predicting pandemics in, uh, you know, pretty much every civilized government in the world, but right. uh, they weren't listened to. Nobody expected it to happen. Well, the of, thing is, it's hard to say when it's going to happen. They, they were pretty much, yeah. when, from when I was reading, pe- people who study pandemics were going like, it will happen. Question yeah. is when? And that's, yeah. that's the hard part to answer. Um, yeah, sure. We could have uh, built resilience into, uh, into our health systems and so on. Um, I think the UK government disbanded their, yeah, their yeah. pandemic uh, study group. So uh, we'll yeah. talk about the anyway. But nevertheless, um, no. Zoom made out real well. That yeah, was- they made out real well. Um, so what can we do in situations where – or environments where – um, we don't know what's going to happen next. You know, will things go back to normal? Will everyone still want virtual meetings and trade? The, the industry I'm in, training, uh, training and coaching, is massively disrupted by this right. this whole thing. Almost as much as the travel industry and the hotel industry, I guess. Right. Um, so, what can you do? You can try different things. You can try make little kind of investments, little investments of time and ideas, maybe of money that aren't going to break you if they don't work because some of them won't work. Some of them will work and you drop the ones, you drop the experiments that fail and you keep and build on the ones that do work. Uh, It can be very easy when you're, you know, if you have a tried and tested method that's worked for you in the past or that, um, if you're coming into the coaching industry and uh, part of your coach training is some kind of marketing method that the founder of that coaching school had used to do extremely well, and they're teaching you that marketing method as part of the uh, part of the training, but it doesn't work in today's world, uh, that can be really tricky because uh, mm-hmm. what are you going to do? Are you going to double down on it and keep doing it, or are you going to try something else? Right. So we we need to you know lift our head up, look around a little bit, occasionally, come out of analytic mode, stop working the plan for a moment, take a look round, see what else is going on, see other things you could try, get ideas from other people, see what's working for other people, I guess, and learn from them. So it sounds, if I may, um, it sounds a little bit like what you're saying is that you make your own luck, if you will, by by being able to be flexible and use in a way the to, ideas behind appreciative inquiry to say, you know, to, 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 to an ex, to an extent. Yeah. Um, you, you make some of your own luck and there's stuff going on. So sure. I, I like to think of it as being, I'm, I'm not a surfer, uh, but it is a bit like surfing in that there is the sea. It's huge and powerful, uh, you have to work with it, uh, and you can do some amazing things with the sea and the surfboard. Uh, there are multiple ways to screw yourself up that they probably just never even think about. And sometimes it's not going to work anyway, but when it does, it's, it's amazing. Right. Um, so the skill, you know, the, the skill of the surfer has a huge influence, but it's not the whole thing they can still wipe out. Right. Uh, I did think of something else actually while I was in the middle of that rant, um, (laughs) which actually relates back to appreciative inquiry and may be really, really useful to individual listeners. Right. Which is this. We as creatures, as human beings, we tend to pay more attention to negatives and problems than we do to positives and opportunities. You can see why that would have worked um, in our evolutionary past uh, you know, if you're paying more attention to a nice juicy antelope than you are to a hungry lion, you're probably not going to survive to pass your genes on mm. to the next generation. Um, so it's easy to forget when you have had success. It's easy to forget that if you're only focused on problems, it's, um, it's easy to forget that you do have some skills and there are things that you are good at. And people are good in different ways. So 
Think about what's worked for you in the past. Think about when have you really enjoyed coaching? When have you really been felt you're doing just the right thing as a coach? When, when has it seemed like the world has been throwing opportunities your way? There will be times when it's been more like that than not. Uh, or certainly, you know, times when it's been better than other times. So focus on those. Mm, yeah. uh, there is gold to be mined there. What was going, what was important to you about that? What happened? What conditions were in place that allowed you to be successful? Because if you can replicate those and make sure they're there more of the time, you're going to have more success. How can you not? Yeah, no, that's brilliant. And, I, you know, I, you, you didn't hear the um, <laughs> earlier podcast, but my first, my first guest, my first interview was done with a man named Dave Buck, who was around with Thomas Letter in, in the early days of coaching. And he says, you know, for him, coaching comes from this teams, you know, coaching teams, you, you, you play games. It's a, it's a game. And it's like when you're a kid, when you're playing, it's not like, okay, what are the strategies for success that we have to employ? Let's read, you know, and it's not like that. You, you, you're saying, Hey guys, guys, let's play. Come on. You know, and you just, you're creative and it's just joyous and playful. And it sounds kind of like that's what you're saying too, as well. Like, you know, go to that place inside you where you've been successful before. Remember what that's like access, you know, relive it, feel it, get it into that playfulness, you know, and go yeah. from there. What's what works. Yeah. And then you don't need to motivate yourself because, right. you know, you want to do it anyway. You're doing it from love rather than external right. motivation or because you have to, or because something terrible will happen if you don't put the work in. Yeah. 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 Good. And that's kind of the point of being a coach for God's sake. It's not just work all the time. You know, we're doing this, not because yeah. it's a job, you know, I, most people that I know who go into coaching, it's because th- there's something that lights them up when they do this. It's, it it yep. feeds their soul, not just their pocketbook. Yeah. And you need both. Yep. Beautiful. And plus you can get this really nice house in France too, which is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> You could probably uh, you could probably get a holiday home over here, but uh, you, since you're in the same, you know, you're also in the northern hemisphere, there may not be much point. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm very happy with where I'm actually right now. Yeah, in New York near near uh, Woodstock, New York, which is beautiful up here. Mm. A bit cold in the winter, but you know, hey, it's <laughs> winter right now, so I'm not focusing on that. <laughs> so, quick question for you: Do you speak French? Uh, un petit peu, je suis en train de l'apprendre, mais uh, c'est, c'est, c'est pas facile uh, pour, pour moi. Um, not as well as I might do, because, uh, yeah, a little bit. Um, you, can, you can buy a loaf of bread. You know, you can, you know. oh, I, I, can do, I can do that. And um, by the standards of English expats, I'm not doing too badly. The, the kind of hurdle is that all my work is in English. So, and you know, we're not like interacting with our neighbors every day. We've got great neighbors, um, but they're quite, you know, they're on another big plot of land and the house is quite a distance away. So we see the guy, probably wave to the guy every day, speak to him a couple of times a week, maybe. Do you wave wave to him in French or do you wave to him in English? (laughs) Uh, No, I'm still waving in English, I think. But uh, it's one of those situations where the body language is pretty much the same, I think. So (laughs) for waving, it's fine. A whole load of other stuff. But uh, waving waving is pretty much universal. (laughs) It is interesting, though, in different different parts of the world. Malaysia, I'm suspecting, might be one of them. You know, waving is different, Um, isn't it? I don't know about I don't know about waving to be honest because um Not much of that waving's never really come up but yeah there there are there are cultural differences um even even in tiny little things like okay so you've done uh like corporate type training courses in hotels right yeah where they I don't know what it's like in North America but you know in the UK generally you get some coffee and you get some biscuits. And if you're lucky, you may get some like pastries. Mm -hmm. Um, In Malaysia, mid-morning break, you get 
like three or four different uh, savory courses in, <laughs> in these things. So you could have like an entire like second breakfast Hobbit style or um, early lunch. Then you get a massive lunch. Then you get more. Uh, then you get more savory stuff in the mid afternoon break, and um, amazingly, you know, they're mostly pretty slim. I don't know how they do it. <laughs> It's quite extraordinary. They like their food there, uh, for sure. It's the only time they so because it's during business uh, business luncheons. It's the only time they ever eat. Could be, could be. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> well, Andy, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for being here on the Essential Coaching because it's really a pleasure and really valuable, really interesting stuff. Thank, thank you so much. I've never heard of appreciative inquiry before today, and now I'm going to be uh, looking at it quite deeply. I'll uh, yeah, I'll I'll send you uh, I'll send you the little e booklet, which is like a guide or an intro to it, and a, a step by step guide to how to uh, help your team improve their effectiveness, right. which people get when they sign up to my website. So I'll I'll just send you that. What's your website? Um, well, I have two, depending on the areas of interest of uh, your audience. So the one about appreciative inquiry, emotional intelligence, coaching skills, stuff like that, leadership is coachingleaders.co.uk. Wow, that's a nice one, coachingleaders.co.uk. Co.uk, yeah, somebody in America already had coachingleaders.com, although I'm, I'm not sure they're using it, but uh, yeah, so I went with the co.uk years ago. Uh, and then... The NLP one, uh, which has got loads and loads of articles about NLP and a few little videos and things, is nlppod.com because it's for the Practical NLP Podcast, which um, I let slip for a couple of years. It's been dormant for a couple of years, but when you contacted me, Doug, uh, I thought, what the hell, I can revive this and uh, we can you know, put some more interviews out with uh, leading figures in NLP, which is... Uh, Certainly, what you've been, even if you if you are going in a different direction now, um, you've certainly been the leading figure in NLP in the past. So, very cool. Thank you. So uh, that's called NLP Practical NLP Podcast. No, uh, well, the if you put Practical NLP Podcast into Google, I'm hoping my site will come up. But the uh, the actual site is called NLPPod.com. That's the URL of it. Gotcha. Very nice. Yeah. Well, great to see you. Yeah, great. It must be over 10 years, I would say, yeah, probably like 15 years since we, yeah. Um, yeah. And you look exactly the same. <laughs> well, that's our show for today. Thank you so much for joining me. If you want any more information about today's show, please visit our website at www.essentialcoachingskills.com. Be sure to tune in again next week for our next episode and discover even more about the systems and the secrets that set the best apart.